Welcome to In It To Win It. This is Steve Barton and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have Lobo Tigre of the Independent Speculator on the show. Lobo has focused on commodities and natural resource companies for over two decades. And today we're going to ask your questions and pick his brain on precious metals, copper, uranium, platinum, palladium, oil, and gas. Lobo, thank you for coming back on the show. Happy to be here. It might be slim pickings, but at least it'll be honest pickings. <laughs> 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 oh, it's never slim pickings with you, sir. I uh, I gotta personally thank you for your weekly uh, recap email uh, that we get every week. For me, for me, it's a must uh, a must read every week. You know, it's a funny thing about that. I have so little regard for most macro analysis. You know, it's it's a great way to make promises, and you know, you know, some big picture that you know the, the end of the dollar or whatever, right? And and yeah, in 10 or 20 years or in our lifetime, that might happen. It might even be inevitable. Um, but it's so many years down the road that if you've got something to peddle, you know, you've you've laughed all the way to the bank before you can be proven right or wrong. So so I give away the macro. The weekly letter is free because I think that's what macro in general is worth. But the, the, the mainstream of economics is so bad. They're just I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I'd say they're evil, but they, they're, they're taught in school and they work on these models that are just wrong. Um, and so you, you kind of in self-defense, you have to become a macro analyst just because, you know, the, the world around us is just, just wrong. And okay. Oh, you know, sorry, too much answer to shoot too short a question, but that's not a tinfoil hat statement, right? The, the, the mainstream economics, it equates, you know, um, inflation and growth. Right, inflation is not anything to do with money printing. It's because of growth. That in in that definition or that view, that this is the mainstream view. This is how their models work. Stagflation is not possible in that model, but it's certainly possible in the world. We've just seen some in Europe. You know, the famous stagflation in the 1970s in the U.S. It, it's clearly something that happens, but is completely inconsistent with that model that they used to make all these forecasts and unfortunately policy decisions anyway sorry bit of a rant there but <laughs> yeah uh so i think the point was you know I, I have so little regard for macro analysis that i give mine away for free <laughs> <laughs> well for me it's a must read i like how you overview basically all the commodities we follow you know copper gold silver uranium every week and it's uh, uh yeah it just gives you a real quick um, I mean, if you're a speed reader, three minutes, if you're a normal reader, eight, and, uh, you know, in less than 10 minutes, you've got an idea of what happened the previous week and kind of what you expect for the next one. So keep it up, sir. I love it. Um, okay, let's start out like we always do. And what is your macro view of the world economy and financial markets today? Great segue after what I just said about macro. <laughs> so for what that's worth. Um I guess since the last time we've talked, and most people are who've heard of me, they're generally aware that I've been in team hard landing all along. I'm still there, but I'm more and more impressed by Lynn Alden's work on what she calls fiscal dominance. And it is what's different. It's not that I, I've ignored fiscal and only focused on, on Fed monetary policy. I'm aware that fiscal matters. Um, but it, But what's What's different is I was expecting, based on past behavior, that they would drop the ball, bad things would happen, the Fed would tighten too much, too high for too long, according to mainstream economics, break something, right? The Fed breaks something, typically, the labor market. There would be bad things happen. And then as the recession became undeniable, or that it was coming would become undeniable, then the money helicopters would fly. So my thesis was never we're going to see years of soup lines and that sort of thing. My thesis was that um, the mainstream medicine of throttling the economy to deal with, with inflation would throttle the economy, bad things would happen, and then the money helicopters would fly again. Uh, but what the fiscal dominance thesis says, or what it's starting to look to me like it may imply, is that you know, the money helicopters have been flying all along, maybe in stealth mode, maybe without big, huge announcements, or 
not even stealth mode, like the, the grossly misnamed Inflation Reduction Act is a huge spending bill. Okay, but that was years ago, you say. Well, yeah, it was voted on years ago. Appropriations happen subsequently. And then the spend takes time before shovels hit the ground and the money starts circulating around. This is, you know, classic example of long and variable lags. So what I'm saying is I'm still in the hard landing. I, there's a difference between, you know, rosy cheeks due to health and rosy cheeks due to makeup. And, you know, you can stimulate an economy so it looks healthy, but it's not the same as organic, healthy, you know, internal growth. So it's it does matter. But in terms of inflation and GDP and the kind of numbers that economics, economics uh, models use and so on, and this includes investment houses, includes Wall Street, not just the Fed, not just the people in Washington, right? We, we may not get that undeniable hard landing we may get a completely deniable hard landing. What I'm saying is I think the damage is still being done. And as you and I speak, we just got the JOLTS report and it showed fewer job openings and fewer quits, which is really interesting. The, the, the quits rate, you know, that, that tells you that the psychology is changing. It's one thing for the companies to say, oh, yeah, maybe we're a little worried. We, we, don't, we don't want to hire so many people. It's another thing for these people who got all their stimmy checks and who, who had the great resignation and all this stuff for the people to start saying, ah, you know what, maybe it's not a good time to quit my job. You know, at least I've got one. Right. So I see the data still backing up my thesis. You, you, you don't go from zero interest rates to five and a half percent without something giving somewhere. But if there's a lot of fiscal stimulus at the same time, that could be masked. That's the makeup is what I'm saying, as opposed to the bona fide health of the economy. So we'll see. I, we, we are at crunch point now. It's rare for me to make predictions. As you know, I, I try to avoid the prediction racket. Um, and certainly, as Doug Casey says, if you're going to make predictions, don't say when they're going to come true. Just make your prediction, right? But I, I sincerely believe, and I may be wrong, but I sincerely believe that we are at that point now where either... I'm wrong, there is no hard landing and the Fed pulled off its miraculous soft landing or no landing, uh, or I'm right. And the cracks that we've seen appear and widen in the labor market really since last July, you know, that that is serious. So it, like even in the few uh, two months we have left in this year, I think we start to see this unraveling and then the response or I'm wrong and the fiscal dominance has has masked it and we get the, the soft landing or no landing scenario. But here, here's the takeaway though. Never mind the theory. That's the macro theory. That's the freebie. Here's here's the pig, right? Um if I'm right, it's very bullish for monetary metals, gold and silver. It's it's bullish for anything real because the money helicopters will fly and anything real will do well in that highly inflationary environment. If I'm right, however, it's too early to jump into some realish real assets like oil and copper because they always get hammered when there's recession news. Always. That's an unbroken track record. So if I'm right and we get to that, oh, beep moment, then oil and copper will be cheaper. Other industrial metals will be cheaper. So-called precious metals that are actually industrial metals like platinum and palladium will be cheaper. Everything industrial gets cheaper. The only exception is uranium because that's such a different market. So if I'm right, you don't want to buy the industrial minerals or energy sector except for uranium. You do want gold and silver and uranium. If I'm wrong, the one, what happens then? Well, if I'm wrong and they pull off the no landing or soft landing or whatever, that's instantly inflationary. So, so it's still good for gold and silver and uranium. So the things that I'm willing to buy now do well whether I'm right or I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, however, then you probably should be buying copper stocks now. Copper is, I think, a, a, a no-brainer. And, and you know, the moment I'm sure that the worst is behind us, I'm, buy, I'm going on copper, probably oil too. Oil, there's the Middle East, there's a lot of variables there. Um, but it's hard for me to see super cheap oil anytime soon, not with the world the way it is. Uh, then again, you know, markets are forward looking, traders are crazy. We had oil go negative in 2020. So again, if I'm right, oil and copper go down. 
if I'm wrong, everything goes up and you miss out on the lowest prices for oil and copper. So I'd rather, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't say I don't have a crystal ball because I got one, but it doesn't tell me the future. Um, and um, so if I'm wrong, then I will miss out on oil and copper lows, right? but I won't miss out on the multi-year runs afterwards. There's still plenty of time to make money. So why should I take the chance? You know, I, I, you know, I'd rather, I've got stocks in these spaces that I think are gonna win, win either way. Why take a chance on something that I could maybe get out at 50% off in, a, in two months? Yeah, so that's the way I see it. That's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I, I think it's important to not pretend that I know the future and to lay out the options here. Your mileage may vary, dear audience, you know, you know, make your pick. Okay, yeah, that's interesting, especially what you mentioned about the stealth uh, QE that's going. Back in 1929, when they had soup lines, that was undeniable. But now that we have EBT cards, that's very, very hideable and very stealth, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but I, my, my partner, she sees them in the supermarket. I, I don't, I can't tell. She's more observant than I am, but you know, she can tell, uh, you know, the Prada purse from a fake Prada purse or whatever at a hundred meters, you know, I, I, I would know. But she can tell, she sees when they bring out these cards at the supermarket and she, she gets mad, she gets offended because this is not like a poor person with this card. It's this person wearing expensive stuff. And they pull out the, the food card. You, you don't see that it's government assistance. But the, the, the blindness of the system, its inability to distinguish those in need, really in need, versus those who are abusing the system. Uh, sorry, don't get me started. That'll be another rant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a but, real but fan yeah, of it's government. Part of the stealth thing, you know, and it's, um, but, but the key takeaway is, is, this may sound like I'm making an excuse, but I think if I'm wrong, or dear audience, if you have been in that camp that thought there's no way they can throttle the economy this much without something breaking, right? Not just me, a lot of people have thought this. If you think that way, and it turns out that there's no landing, it's not that the world has changed or you're crazy or you're just an idiot. I think it's got to do with fiscal dominance hitting earlier than expected. Like the money helicopters, I've been waiting for something bad for them to fly. What have they been flying the whole time? Right, you see the difference? So yeah. no, you're not crazy. You're not wrong in the sense of the way the world works. It's just that they pulled one over on us. Yeah, yeah, they're very good at that. Uh, okay, uh, listener question, Philip wants to know. He says, everyone talks about inflation and the falling value of the US dollar. What are your thoughts on what will happen with other currencies? For example, the Australian dollar. Well, I'm not a Forex trader. So if the, if the question is, you know, which is the best fiat to bet on, you know, I'm not the guy to answer. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about in the right environment, the oil currencies, you know, the Norwegian crown or something like that. The Swiss franc used to be the safe haven currency, but you know, the Swiss franc has really become just another fiat. It's another floating abstraction. You know, which one will float more, which, you know, who's going to win the race to the bottom? I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Uh, what I do know is that they're all, you know, they're all fiat. They're all worthless. They're all, if you pull back and look at the big picture, being debased and therefore anything real. And that includes gold and silver, but, you know, real assets, property, houses, whatever. In real terms, those things are going up. And if, the, you know, if, I'm not a chartist, but to my mind, and I've said this many times, but for, for that one person out there who hasn't seen it yet, if there's just one chart about money that you need to look at and understand, it's the long-term chart of uh, the dollar's purchasing power, even using CPI, which is giving the other side much too much credit, but you know the declining value of the dollar versus the gold dollar exchange rate, AKA the price of gold. It's a giant X. It's a little bit of a curvy X, but it's a giant X. Over the 70 years since the dollar was severed from gold, gold was free to have a little bit of price discovery, even if manipulated or phony, but some. It's a giant X. The dollar loses value and the other ones lose value as well. It's, 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 I'm not just beating up on the dollar. All fiats are losing. And lo and behold, we have gold hitting all-time highs in other currencies before the dollar. So if the dollar is the last man standing, Right. There so then, <laughs> right. So, and I, there's one of these on my website somewhere, but 
if you superimpose the gold on that too, it's a it's a giant X. It goes the other way, yeah. And and by the way, this is this makes it look like oh, it lost so much more at the beginning. Well, that's because <laughs> you know once you go from ninety cents to ten cents, right? You know the, the going from nine cents to one cent is on a percentage basis just as much, but on this scale showing the whole dollar, the nine cents to one cent just looks tiny. So, so this makes it look like the dollar's been losing less value more recently, but that's an artifact of scale. It's actually not true. That, and, and this is partly why the X looks curvy, like I was saying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this is it. This this is it's just an incontrovertible fact. This, <laughs> I mean, just I don't I don't need to prove this, but just think about your experience. I remember as a kid in the back of the car, my father complaining about gasoline prices in the high 30 cents. I mean, what's going to happen next? 40 cents a gallon? Oh, that'd be like the end of the world he was thinking this would be, but you know, I mean, that's this is incontrovertible. Right? The, the the fiat currencies, they're all being debased. The none of them are safe. Doesn't matter to me which one wins in the short term or whatever. I'm not a forex trader. And it's why I save uh, I literally have no savings account. I have only current accounts. And if I'm putting any money away for savings, I'm putting it in a CD in a bank and who knows what the hell happens or they have a bank holiday or a bail-in or something. I'm stacking silver and gold. Um, this has worked for me in the past. <laughs> what uh, You have a story about how stacking your silver got you and your family out of a pinch. Uh, do you mind uh, going over that? Sure, that is a, it's a true story. It's it's available for free on the website. The article is called "In Defense of Hard Money." You just probably search for "defense" in the little you know magnifying glass thingy. You'll find it. And so, yeah, as a as a kid, I participated in the Great Bull Run of the seventies. I, I didn't quite top ticket, <laughs> but I kept buying, and I didn't have money enough to buy gold coins. So I was I was putting my lawnmower money into silver coins and things. But even before that, as a, as a kid in Mexico, I collected coins and I collected uh, silver pesos were going out of like coin pesos were just going out of circulation. And I think they were mostly 10 or some crap. I don't know what, but but they had a smidgen of silver in them. So I just started collecting them and, and hoarding those old silver pesos. And the story is, you know, flash forward 1999, I had a personal uh, sort of job rug pull in a financial crisis. And I was literally on my way to Costa Rica in a Winnebago full of kids. And, and this happened, I'm in Mexico and suddenly I've got no job and, and meager savings and I had to do something. So I put together a business plan and I started a new publication uh, and I went to a pawn shop and I took a bunch of my old silver pesos. So this is silver pesos from Mexico in Mexico like uh, 40 or 50 years after they were minted. Huh. And guess how much the pawn shop gave me for those coins? They uh, gave me one peso each, just so happened. They gave me one peso. So think about what would have happened if I had pesos in the bank over 50 years. How many times did they lock two, three, four zeros off? Those, you know, if I had a thousand pesos in the bank in 1960, it would have been worth I don't think it would have been worth one peso, like, you know, maybe 10 cents or something like that, 10 Mexican cents. So I went down with a handful of these diluted, you know, adulterated with a smidgen of silver, silver pesos to the pawn shop, and they gave me one peso each. So that shows you that even just that little smidgen of silver had enough real value that whatever happened to the face value, the nominal value of the currency, the silver, the real value was there. And they gave me, I gave them a handful of old silver pesos. They gave me a handful of paper new pesos. And I, I literally went from there to the supermarket and bought food uh, to feed my family while I worked on my business plan to get myself back together. So yeah, I'm a real believer in, in real money, you know, hard money that can't be printed by anybody. And, and I don't stack because I think the gold dollar ratio is going up. I, that's not a speculation or even an investment for me. I, it's, I, I, I own it because it's real. I can hold it in my hand, right? It, they'd have to physically come steal it from me in person if they wanted to take it, right? They, they can't do it with a click of a, of a button. And by the way, it, it works when the internet doesn't. So not, not to beat up on our, our Bitcoin friends, but you know, it, it works even in a Mad Max scenario. 
So yeah, that that's the story. It's a true story. It actually happened. I fed my family because I believed in hard money. And you know, when basically a, a worst possible case scenario, can you imagine? <laughs> you know, I had five bikes strapped to the top of the Winnebago and the pets and the kids and everything. And then just like it all fell apart halfway across the world. Wow. That's that is exactly why we stack. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, okay, Blaine wants to know, he says. What might be the short and long-term ramifications on silver of Russia announcing adding silver reserves to their state fund? Well, probably nothing. I have to say, you know, I am bullish on silver. I am concerned. People call me names and stuff. I am concerned about its industrial impact going into the recession, being still in team hard landing. I mean, it's just a fact that silver's industrial aspect has had a, a larger influence on that market. So it, it just, it doesn't pay to be religious about these things and ignore the facts. Um, you know, in this thing, it's it's a report. Are they even going to do it? Is it is it Putin rattling the West's cage? Just, you know, who knows? Uh, the guy's a master chess player. It could be any number of things. But even if they do do that. I mean, it's just silver is so much bulkier than gold. I, I, I would be very surprised if it amounted to much. But okay, let's say it really happens and they really start socking away a large amount of silver. That would, in fact, constitute a new end use of sorts. Like, you know, 10 years from now, they might be forced to liquidate it or whatever. At some point, that silver could come back to the market. But while they're accumulating, that would be a new end use. That silver isn't coming back in the market. It's not going in the photo panels. It's not doing anything else. It's just sitting in a vault somewhere in Russia. So that constitutes new offtake. If it was substantial enough, I do think it would matter. Um, but yeah, I think it's premature to say that it's going to happen at all. And then and if it'll happen on a scale enough to matter. Okay. All righty. And follow up. Um, has your wait and see views on Mexican silver miners changed at all? Uh, no, no, I, I I know there's a lot of optimism out there and Scheinbaum's talking about being more business friendly. Uh, but, you, you know, the, the Democrats in the U.S. are talking about being more business friendly, too, and it doesn't stop them from slapping new taxes or regulations or whatever, you know. It, the idea, at least in most of these, you know, populist leaning in, in not just U.S., but around the world, is to... Uh, you know, talk the talk, but then, you know, you're still going to regulate the heck out of them. You're still going to tax the heck out of them. They'd rather give a subsidy than cut regulations or taxes. You know, they, instead of actually improving the business environment, they'd rather give you bad business environment medicine in the form of subsidies, which of course means more taxes and more negative feedback. So it's it's this horrible situation. Um, and, you know, how do you tell if a politician is lying? His or her lips are moving. So no, I'm I'm not at all convinced. I need to see it. And by the way, it won't be a policy announcement. If the government came out and said, uh, we are we realize that mining is important in Mexico and we are pro-responsible mining, that would seem like an about face. I'm sure a lot of Mexican stocks would go up immediately on that announcement. I wouldn't believe it. I would wait to see what the actual bureaucracy does. Because bear in mind, under the AMLO administration, they didn't pass any laws against the mining. I mean, they did nationalize lithium, but they don't have any lithium production. So like they made a big fuss about it and they didn't actually do anything. But over the course of the administration, the regulators, the bureaucracy, the people that issued the permits got more and more uncooperative until they just got to know, we're just not issuing any more permits for open pit mines. The, the minister said, Oh, there were just too many in the last administration. We're not issuing any more. Doesn't matter due process. Doesn't matter you've got your EIS approved. Doesn't matter what you do. We're not giving you any more permits. So, so hear what I'm saying. It didn't matter what the policy was. Didn't matter what the law was. They just said no. And who's going to stop them? Right? You could sue them. You know, good luck getting that through the Mexican courts in less than 20 years. So, let's see what they actually do. If they actually become more pro-mining, yes, that would make a difference to me. And it would be great because so many great silver plays are unfortunately in basket case jurisdictions like that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So like any politician, you'll, you'll, you'll wait and see what they actually do 
not uh, not what they say, and uh, hopefully they, they do something that's uh, more pro-mining. Okay, um, Lower Kula wants to know, what are Lobo's thoughts on tightening stops on miners during increased volatility? <laughs> well, it would be the opposite. If I use stops, I'd loosen them on increased volatility. If you tighten your stops, you can get stopped out when you don't want to. It could be some, you know, some stupid headline as you know makes a completely knee-jerk reaction that's wrong-headed, which would be the perfect time to buy, but your stop is going to have you sell instead. Though actually, I don't use stops on mining stocks. Even the majors, the so-called you know safer ones, they're so volatile. But heck, actually, these days, the biggest companies in the world, your your Teslas and your Apples and just so on, these things can fluctuate 20% in a day. So how do you use stops in an environment like that? You put a 50% stop? Well, what's the point? You're already down 50%, right? So no, for mining stocks, I've never used stop losses. They, I don't want a computer making my sell decisions for me. I will set notifications. And, and if I get it, something like that triggered, oh, then I'll, you know, look at that. There's, there's a silly headline. This is wrong headed. This, you know, this makes, you know, the market is wrong. Then, you know, I'll back up the truck and buy more. Um, but so if I was going to use stops, then I would loosen them rather than tighten them, you know, but in, but in general, I just don't, I think the mining stocks are too volatile for stops at all. You got to pay attention. Gee, that's a lot of work. Well, you know, you want to make money, you got to work. This is not a get rich quick scheme. It's not free money. Um, I'm a due diligence guy, not, not a, you know, handout guy. <laughs> I'm the teach a guy how to fish rather than the give a guy a fish sort of guy. Oh, one more thing. And that is, I do have something I call the upside maximizer strategy, which is another free download you can find on our website in the free report section. And I do use a form of trailing stop loss, but it's not a stop loss. It's used to lock in gains. The idea is, is not to have some computer sell for me because there's a market fluctuation. But when I have a big win, you know, if you get a big win in the old Doug Casey days, we would sell half on the first double and ride the rest, you know, free of risk. It's a great idea. In these super volatile stocks, it's a great idea. But the problem is if it, if it becomes a 10-bagger and you sold on the first double, your 10-bagger became a five-bagger. And that caused a lot of pain for a lot of people. So my solution is instead of selling a, you know, on the first double, you, you let it ride, but you put a trailing stop loss that keeps ratcheting up. So as long as it keeps going up, then you keep going up. And if it goes all the way to 10X before it corrects, then you get your 10-bagger. But the moment it rolls over, the stop loss kicks in. It's not a loss. It's you know the stop gain loss kicks in. The upside maximizer gets triggered, and then you decide. You know, well, is this bad news? Yeah, I'm going to take all my money and run. Is, you know, is it buying up? You know, but, you know, you make a decision. You get the trigger, and you, the human being, decide what to do with it. So, so there is a place for stops in my world, but just it's like the opposite of what most people use stops for. Okay. Yeah. If it's on an uptrend like that, you can put a 5% trailing stop on it. And if it keeps going, you keep making money. If it does roll over, it triggers. And then conceptually, yes, but, but erase that 5% number from your head. There's so many mining stocks. They'll do that intraday every day, every week, that, you know, especially the juniors. Uh, I mean, I don't even want to put a number on it. I, I will look at the numbers. You can do a statistical analysis of typical volatility stock. You can just eyeball the chart and say, oh, look, you know, it often fluctuates five, 10% or 10, 15%. So at that point, you, you know, your, your upside maximizer trigger, if it's 15% is a typical volatility, you wouldn't wanna be triggered unless it goes say 20%. And that's not a number to, to, to put on everything. I'm just saying it's an example where you need to look at the reality, not in general, not for mining stocks, for that specific stock, what does it do and what would constitute a change in its behavior? So yes, again, it's one of those things where you have to pay attention. This isn't a, you know, a get rich quick scheme or, or easy money scheme. You know, I work hard at what I do, uh, but I try hard to, to help my clients uh, make the best of it. Okay. Yeah. We'll put a link to that uh, article down below. Uh, I've read it. It's a really good one. Um, okay. And wants to know, says, uh, my explorers and developers are not responding on any level to the rise in corresponding metals of over 30% like they were in 2019 and 2020. And generally speaking, based on my producers, the generalist and retail investor is not involved in the sector in any measurable way. 
has this extent of non-interest been overcome before? And what was the catalyst that changed the sentiment? It's a very sharp question. Um, in my experience, no, I've never seen anything quite like this. Typically, you know, the the my 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 mentors, my teachers would say, you know, the typical pattern was the majors move first, and then it would sort of trickle down in mid tiers, and the juniors would move last. Uh, but because they're so small, you know, then they had more hockey stick potential. Um, but I have, it just seems like that pattern is broken down. I remember in 2008, when we had this super sharp V-shaped bottom in gold, and people forget, you know, that gold actually ended the year in the black. It was, it just came screaming back from that waterfall event in October, November of 2008. Um, it wasn't just the majors that came right, you know, the, the quality juniors or the companies that were actually building a mine that had high margins in a, in a bankable full feasibility study, you know, they came screaming back or the juniors that were just hitting it out of the ballpark, you know, every round of drill results, high grade, you know, thick, high grade gold or, or copper or whatever it was, you know, there was, a, there was an immediate response. Um, this differentiation that the, that the, viewer is asking about it, it's i've never seen anything quite like it it makes me nervous i will admit but i'll go a little bit further and uh, on the one hand i'm congratulating the reader for the sharp question on the other hand if you've got a lot of stocks that aren't moving uh, you need to ask yourself who picked those stocks because the stocks are moving even the directs i mean i I've, I've got one or two in my portfolio like one that isn't isn't one gold stock that isn't responding to higher gold at all it's just flatlined, uh, but it's so flatlined. There's something artificial about that. that. That's just not right. That's like, there is somebody consistently selling at a certain threshold, no matter what. Uh, and I got to figure that out. But, but even the underperformers, they've all come up a little. I mean, the, the, the high flyers, you know, the go-to names, they're all way up, right? You know, the other ones, you know, they, they didn't respond right away, but you know, it's hard as you and I are speaking, gold is closer to 2,800 than 27. You know, um, e so even the underperformers, they've started to curve up. So if you've got one that isn't moving at all, I'm not saying sell it right away, but that is absolutely a red flag. And, and for my portfolio, the ones that I see as not performing as they should, that's a red flag. And I'm having this hard conversation with myself and my clients. Do I sell this? Do I buy more? What do I do? Why is this doing this? Um, so I just, yeah, I, I just think that's really important. And for everybody out there, if you've got dogs that won't bark, even if you dangle the red stake of 2,800 right in front of his nose, right, there's something wrong with that dog. And you need to find out why and what you're going to do about it. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, have I answered all the questions? So I think, sorry, the, the, I think the, the main takeaway that the, uh, that the person wanted was, well, where do we go from here? Or will these dogs bark in the end? And actually, I do think so. If we get a mania phase, if, if gold becomes the flavor of the day, anything with gold in the name is going to run. I mean, it's just like, you know, you see these insane things with any, any company that even mentioned AI uh, over the last year, the stock would move. Didn't matter if they didn't do anything, you know, they could have been a potato farm or something. Oh, <laughs> you know, we're going to use AI to grow better potatoes. Oh, the stock would double, right? You know, that sort of thing can happen in the mining space. It, um, and in that kind of environment, yes, everything will go, you know, uh, rising tide lifts off ships, but the ones with the holes in their holes, they don't last very long on that rising tide. So I'm not saying it's okay to go out and buy all kinds of crap. The answer to the question is, unless this time is different, uh, yes, even the dog's you know, of the market, they should all, they should all go. Uh, but I'd still rather bet on the better ones. And, and the fact that we're even having this conversation, in my view, it's a huge endorsement of my point of being a due diligence guy. That's why I don't buy ETFs in general. I don't want a basket of what somebody else thinks are the best juniors out there, the GDXJ or the GDX, you know, and even the GDX, those aren't juniors. Those are all billion dollar companies. Um, so, yeah, I want to pick my own stocks. And I, and I got to say, you know, last year, the, the stocks were not responding. We were having a different conversation. It wasn't, you know, why aren't some of these stocks? It was, it was why aren't any of these stocks responding to higher gold? And I had taken some profits. So my current portfolio was in the red at the end of last year. And I'm up 50% now. 
So it's gone from in the red to up 50% on average, including the underperformers, including the dogs. So stock selection matters. So I may sound like I'm bragging a bit here, but the, but the point is um, don't rely on the market to save you from your mistakes. If you've made any mistakes, you've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to drop the ax. You can't fall in love with these things. Okay. Company selection. That's how I can summarize that. <laughs> I'm a stock picker. What can I say? Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> Check out Lobo's service, at least his free newsletter. It'll be in the pinned comment below. Uh, okay, moving on to copper and electricity. Peter says, assuming that big tech follows through with their massive investments in nuclear infrastructure for their data centers, do you think we will see some correlation in the price action of uranium and copper or even silver, perhaps? If so, what sort of catalyst should an investor be on the lookout for? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, that's a thesis that will take years, if not decades, to roll out. I mean, we've got all these wonderful headlines that maybe the fastest one would be bringing Three Mile Island back online for Microsoft. Uh, but even that, it's going to take years. And for Google to build six of these new small modular reactors, this doesn't even exist in the United States yet. So this is a new technology. The plants, the designs have been approved on some of these. <laughs> Just the designs, right? That's, that's the stage we're at. And who knows where copper and silver will be and what they'll be doing at that time. Uh, you know, Broadly speaking, that giant X we talked about before, fiat's down, real things up. Sure, there'll be some correlation between copper and silver and gold and uranium. And sure, anything real that's necessary and valuable. But I, I don't think that's going to help me make investment decisions. And it's far enough in the future that even though I am, for, take, take copper, for example, uh, I, I am bullish on a multi-decade scale there. Like the, the amount of copper we need, it's, it's just huge and growing. And we don't even need these AI centers or any of this stuff. Just the world population growth demands more copper. And then the new use cases demands even more. And one of my favorite things is like, well, you know, there's all this fight over whether, you know, the, the uh, lithium batteries or whether the, you know, well, no, people actually want hybrids now. The EVs are done. We want hybrids. But it doesn't matter whether you have a big battery or a little battery. It doesn't matter much. You still need the copper to hook it up. Like the connections are still copper. And, and yes, aluminum is cheaper and it conducts electricity, but it's more brittle. It, it resulted in a bunch of house fires in the 1970s in the U.S. There are laws against using aluminum in certain applications. And for, for, for things where you want uh, more flexibility, there's movement or whatever, copper windings and the tight windings, you, you just you want copper, not aluminum. So there's limited substitution of cheaper alternatives for there. So, so there's just so many things about, about copper and most of it, few small high grade mines. Most of it comes from these giant, you know, porphyry things, billion ton projects, multi-billion dollar mines. And those are getting harder and harder to permit anywhere in the world. I mean, we've got a big copper mine. It's not an open pit, but we've got a big copper mine in the United States. It's like 30 years in the permitting process and, it, and it's going back and forth to the Supreme Court. So most of the supply of copper is severely constrained for, for decades to come. And the use case, I mean, this is just like a win-win in my view. I love the copper story. The only reason I'm not buying more copper stocks now is because I'm still in team hard landing. I, I think I'm not trying to time the market, but if the, you know, almost all of the data tells me that I'm likely to get a sale price sometime just ahead, then I'm going to wait for that sale price. And when that changes and either there's no sale price or it's behind me, well then, yeah, I'm, I'm going long. But sorry, I'm getting off the side point. The point is that that, like nuclear, th this is multi-decade bull runs. It doesn't help me choose my stocks now. Um, and the relationship doesn't help me decide how to allocate, you know, this much uranium or this much silver in my portfolio. It it's like um, it's like trying to, to decide how many millimeters to the left or the right I should put a boulder on a mountain three miles away, right? You know, it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't matter right now. Um, but but the idea behind the question, I think, is good. You know, that this, even without, you know, the AI craze, and it looks like the AI craze is not silly. I mean, here's here's a takeaway. I mean, think about this. The 
big companies in this space, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, they have to say all the politically correct things in the media. They have to play nice and they have to say all these things that, you know, otherwise it crawls in a fur or an offender clients or, or the regulators or whoever. So they have to say what they have to say. But when push came to shove and they had to decide where are we going to get our power from? It wasn't windmills I and mean, it wasn't solar panels. It wasn't even hydropower, which by the way, if you have a drought, your hydropower is at risk. And nuclear is the only thing that runs pretty much no matter what, 24-7, 365, rain or shine, you know, drought or you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so they they're all going nuclear. That's really telling us something. That is a sea change. And you know, what more slap in the face could you need to wake up than to revivify Three Mile Island, you know, the the, the subject of horror movies. So yeah, I, I think this is a, a long-term bullish thesis, but we need to pay a lot of attention. You know, our friend Rick Rule likes to say, never confuse the inevitable with the imminent. And, you know, my own riff on that is, you know, don't tell me about inevitable. I don't even want to hear about imminent. I want to know what's happening now. And what's happening now is, you know, the use case is going up for uranium and copper and silver uh, right now. So I, I, I like them, I'm, but I'm, I'm conscious about when I deploy my cash to looking on for the you know trends right now on the market. So where do you want to go from there? Awesome. Uh, well, I want to give a, a, a quick shout out to your latest article, uh, want to buy low and sell high, think copper. Uh, it's my favorite price free. Um, so great report, 30 pages long. Not, not um, the copper, the report. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, the copper is free, the report is. <laughs> but great, uh, great report. You always have some uh, uh, free little nuggets on here, which uh, which I like a lot. I'll put a link to this down in the comments below. Uh, you guys should definitely give it a read if you're going to bet on copper, which should be everyone watching this show. Uh, okay. And Uranium, Econ Wizard. I love the screen name. Uh, looking forward to the Q&A. What's the likelihood we'll see a rebound in prices in uranium in the near future? I think high. Or let's say better than 50-50. You know, when? Who knows? I mean, it's it's pulled back a little bit over the last week, but, you know, nothing goes in a quite straight line. The, the charts have, since, since the peak, over 106 bucks earlier this year, which people hated me, but I did say, you know, this was right for correction, right? We've got the correction. And to me, the important things are one on the chart, it's carving out a bottom, right? It has yeah. started coming up again. You can see it there. Yeah. That yellow line, it started going up again. Um, and that's good. And the, you know, the red line. So, so, I, and that's a, that's like a couple months there, that that low part. I, I'm waving hands and it's probably off camera, sorry, but yeah. No, so, no, you're right. Yeah, it started kind of around, got down around 80, like beginning of August. Right, and yeah. So I, I think that's actually quite encouraging. And what's not on that chart, I don't know if you can do it or not, but the long-term contract price is about that level. And it it has not you know gone up and then rolled over. It's just been going up and up and up. So, and, and that's the sort of the real price. Spot is subject to all kinds of volatility, but the long-term contract price is what the end users are actually buying the stuff for from, you know, it's, it's direct supply and demand. And yes, you have to have it enriched and all that stuff, but you're, but it's a funny market where you have all these middlemen, but you still contract the end user contracts with the actual raw material supplier. And that price is just on a, not straight, but on a solid upward trend. And so the more volatile spot price came down to meet the long-term contract price. And lo and behold, that's where it bounced off and started carving the bottom. So I think it's going to be generally upward from here. It's important to understand that we're already at a price that does incent mine supply. We've, we've been below the cost of production for so many years. It sounds weird, but yes, we've actually got to the point where high prices begin the process of curing high prices. And I think this is one reason for the correction and why it's lasted so long and why there's so much FUD out there, as we like to say these days. Uh, but that said, you know, the, the, the long-term trend, I think, is really important. Uh, and then here's the other thing. And this is, there's, a, there's another free report. There's a uranium download on our website. And we've looked at this. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was worried about the high prices curing the high prices. And then, or, you know, at least initially, because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, a lot of mothballed mines, you know, big ones, high-grade ones, 
and there were projects that were looked very economic, ready to come online. And I was worried. Oh, and we also had people, um, mining companies that bought uranium when it was cheap, not to hold it forever, but to sell it when they were going to build their mines, which they're doing now. So, so you knew that selling was going to come back. Those, those pounds were not sequestered from the market forever, like spot pounds. So for all these reasons, I was more worried about how durable I was, you know, I was more worried that it would hit something like a hundred plus and then just, you know, come back much lower and it would be a problem for years. But I had my team go and look at it. I have one researcher, his name is Constantine, very sharp guy. And we looked hard at it. And we came to the conclusion that actually, even if all the low hanging fruit comes online on schedule, on budget, right? <laughs> but mostly on schedule, it won't be enough. You know, the demand is already going with the, with the Japanese restarts. And the thing about restarts is it doesn't just increase future demand. It, it instantly creates new demand now. So we've got Japanese restarts. We've got US restarts now. We've got Europe trying, you know, except for Germany, you know, trying to go gangbusters in the direction of nuclear. And of course, BRICS countries building them as fast as they can, right? So I was worried that the low hanging fruit could cause for some while the high prices to cure high prices, but no, I'm not. It's not enough. Even if all these mines come online fast, you know, as scheduled, it won't be enough. And they're not. We already know they're not. I mean, the world's largest and lowest cost producer has already moved the goalpost down because it can't ramp up to what it's what it was supposed to do. And, and we've yet to see if the second largest producer can meet their very ambitious goals for this year. But pretty much every mine start or restart that we've seen has had problems. And none of them have been without any kind of hitch at all, at least not in the uranium space specifically. So yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish. Now, can the market fluctuate? Sure. You know, could some scary news out of out of the war in Ukraine, you know, hitting nuclear power plant cause spot prices to go down in a knee-jerk reaction and stuff? Yep, all that could happen. I, you know, I don't know how it's going to go. But absent a major Chernobyl scale event, I think uranium is on an upward trend. I think it continues to go upward. And I think it will be price discovery as the long-term contracts come in, showing what I'm saying, that the low-hanging fruit is, is not enough of it, right? I, I think, uh, you know, I think we're going to, you know, it may not do a 2007 style hockey stick. I, that's not my expectation. My expectation is that it continues to grind higher because that's the reality that we're in now. And you know what, even if it goes flat for years, the difference from spending money building a mine or, or drilling holes in the ground to making money producing the stuff, if you've got a mine that makes money is huge. So you, you you know, there's still money to be made in this space, whether or not uranium goes up. But the answer to the question is, I actually think we've probably seen the bottom for this correction and the trajectory is generally upward. I'm not looking for a spike. I'm just looking for higher prices and for the better businesses, the better companies to deliver value for shareholders. Okay. All right. So that, that white line I drew, uh, it, it, hopefully that's the floor around uh, 80 bucks on that chart and you can see over time uh, not a uh, uh, <laughs> not a pre Fukushima spike hockey stick but a gradual grind higher I think it was it was lower than 80 and we're we're back to 80 and change last I saw so yeah volatility but it, yeah that's the way it looks to me we'll, we'll see I don't have I don't have a future seeing crystal ball but that's how it looks to me okay all righty. Um, okay, Micah has a parlay question. You ready for a parlay question here, Lobo? Uh, she wants to know, what is the outlook for uranium after a Trump win and he ends the Ukraine war and removes Russian sanctions? Well, the three are not necessarily guaranteed, even if the first were taken as a given. Uh, again, you know what a politician says and does? Uh, you know, as a as a person who you know has long and, and strong attachment attachment to the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms, I remember a lot of excitement about this Republican getting into office last time, and he did basically squat for gun owners when he was you know he didn't even try. There was no legislative initiative out of the White House at all. It's just one of many things that he just didn't do. And okay. If you're a conservative and, you, and you're happy with the nominees to the Supreme Court, I'm not saying he didn't do anything. Um, 
but clearly you cannot count on on campaign promises uh personally i think you know his idea that he can end the ukraine war in a day is telling ukraine we're not giving you any more money so go negotiate uh i'm not sure that that ends it in a day ukraine might say fine don't give us any more money we're not going to negotiate we'll, we'll we'll go down fighting and by the way the europeans will still give them money so I just I don't believe Trump's claim on that. Hate me if you will, but I, I don't believe it. Uh, but let's let's say it's true. Let's say there's you know I these things are so complicated. I let me turn the table on the questioner. Remember that there was that Section two thirty two petition and everything gone to Trump for him to help the uranium uh, market. He didn't. Uh, he punted, and eventually they just set up this recommendation of setting up this this uh, strategic reserve, which the Biden administration implemented, not the Trump administration. And by the way, too, Joe Rogan, in his interview with Trump, asked him about nuclear power. And, and I think a classic Trumpian way, his answer was, oh, you know, nuclear power is dangerous, these weapons and all stuff. We're not talking about weapons, we're talking about civilian electricity generation. But people conflate these two all the time. It's it's why there's scary news out of Russia about nuclear weapons and uranium stocks sell off. Like they have nothing to do with each other. Um, but but in so many people's minds, these these issues, these different things are, are mixed together because they share the word nuclear. Um, so Trump said in that interview, you know, he pulled back. He was not strongly pro-nuclear. It, it might be that if all you care, if you're a one-issue voter and all you care about is nuclear energy, that you should vote Democrat because the Biden administration is the one that implemented the strategic uranium reserve. The Biden administration is the one that threw billions of dollars at new nuclear, advanced nuclear. Uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not a Biden supporter. I'm not a Democrat. I'm, I, please hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying I want to vote for Biden. I'm just saying that if all you care about is nuclear power and your uranium stocks, you know, given the track record, not just words, given the actual track records, Harris is more pro-uranium price than Trump. So Take that from what, you know, I'm not telling anybody how to vote. I'm just trying to be realistic. I'm going to hate, get hate no matter what. Um, but the good news is, you know, it's not just Trump. It's the people around him. I think everybody gets that you've got to have nuclear in the mix. I mean, look at Google and Amazon, you know, right, and Microsoft. So I just I just think that that writing is very clear on the wall. I think either administration is going to be pro-uranium at some level or another. I think both candidates are promising the moon in terms of inflationary um, policies, and that's good for any real asset, including uranium, gold, silver, copper, the whole works. So, yeah, it, you know, I'm glad I'm a Puerto Rican and I don't get to vote this time because, I, you know, the lesser of two evils, that's just a horrible choice to have to make. Yeah, yeah, we're we're <laughs> we're not left with a whole lot of fun choices. Uh, okay, yeah. So that uranium report, we'll put that uh, uh, all the reports we mentioned, we'll put we'll put down in the notes below. Uh, moving on to PGMs. Okay, so the platinum group metals. Rookie mistake wants to know: Is he bullish on platinum? And I'd like to add palladium in there. <laughs> no, they're industrial metals. I get. I'm starting to get more hate about this than I get. Got about no, I wouldn't say more than silver. Silver, when 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 I got called Darth Silver, there was just so much anger for not being. Look, if somebody doesn't agree a hundred percent with whatever's going to make your favorite investment go up, that doesn't make them Hitler or Darth Vader or whatever. Right? I mean, they, between intelligent people, there must be room to disagree. That said. Yes, uh, platinum and palladium are industrial metals. I, I never, or I try to avoid assiduously to use the term precious metals because it's vague. And it's not important that a metal is expensive, right? There's there's some weird elements at the high end of the table, of the uh, uh, periodic table that are ridiculously expensive to produce like one microgram, <laughs> right? But it's it's not a monetary metal. It's you know, silly to even call it a precious metal. It's just an extremely um, 
rare commodity, you know. So monetary metals, things that respond to fiscal and economic data, you know, financial instruments, safe haven assets, that's gold and silver. It's not platinum and palladium. Despite Paul Krugman wanting to pay off the national debt with platinum coins, like platinum has, is not money. It's never been used as money. Most people can't tell platinum from palladium from silver for that matter, right? It's just, it's not as useful for money. And no, I won't get sidetracked. So platinum and palladium are industrial metals. I'm still in team hard landing. So this goes back to the very first question. If you think I'm wrong, if you think that the Fed and the powers that be are going to pull off a soft or no landing, then maybe the bottom is in for platinum and palladium just because the economy turns around. And yes, we do still need ice engines for a while, right? I do think the world is going to get rid of them, but it's not going to happen overnight. So yes, there is a case there. That's not my expectation. I still think the economy, the same, the same reason as bullish as I am on copper, you just showed that free report. I'm extremely bullish on copper. I just put a report out talking about the importance of being able to buy low and sell high. Um, so even that I'm not willing to buy now because I think I'm going to get a cheaper price in the immediate you know, near-term future. So even if I was bullish on platinum and palladium, I would put it like copper and say, not now, but I'm not. I think there will be time to see whether I'm right or wrong about the hard landing. If I'm wrong, then let's see how these metals respond. And, and yes, I get that hybrids still have gas engines. And yes, that's good for palladium, maybe the platinum too. But you know, I've been hearing these arguments for so long. Every time somebody brings up platinum to me, they're like, oh, it's, it's rarer than gold and it's so undervalued, it's got to go up. Well, I've been hearing that for almost 15 years. So I'm sorry. No, it doesn't got to go up. You know, just because something is undervalued or, you know, that, that doesn't mean it can't be more undervalued. And you know what? If something continues to be undervalued for more than 10 years, you got to ask yourself if the use case has changed. Sorry, but that, that's just the way the world works. Um, and the other thing is, oh, well, platinum, they're, they're going to, palladium got more expensive. So we're going to go back to using platinum instead of platinum. Well, it's not so easy. They, they operate at different temperatures. I'm not an engineer, but I've talked to people who are. And I understand that you can't even put the catalytic converter in the same place on the engine because of the different temperatures they operate at. So it's, you can't just substitute for the one. For the, you need to change your production line if you're going to switch from palladium back to platinum or vice versa. So it takes a long time for this retooling to happen. And there's all these facile answers. Oh, we're going to switch back to platinum. That's going to make it go up. Or, or oh, uh, you know, South Africa is going to go up in flames and, and you know, there won't be any platinum. Well, yeah, but it just seems to like people say these things year after year and they just don't happen. Maybe this is the year it does, but I don't think anybody knows, or sorry, maybe next year, because we're almost at the end of this one. I don't think anybody knows. And if somebody said, this is a strong maybe, this is my case, I would be you know, inclined to give them more respect than anybody says, oh, it's gotta go up and here's why. I just don't believe that. Okay, so basically, um, uh, if we're going by team hard landing, these are not monetary metals, so they're not going to respond like gold and silver, and history has proven that. Um, and uh, they're more of an industrial metal. Their main use is uh, catalytic converters and ice engines. And in a time of recession, people are buying less cars, thereby creating less demand for these catalytic converters. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the price will uh, go up. By the way, interesting sub point to that. I, I, I promise I won't digress too much. But the typical recessionary impact on cars and car buying, you can see it. You can, this is chartable, uh, is around two years. And, and this is consumer behavior. So even if like the, the GDP number comes back, like the money helicopters fly, after your house, your car is, for most people, their second biggest purchase. It's not something you rush out and spend money on. You get a stimmy check in the mail. You know, maybe you'll go to Vegas or maybe you'll buy more stuff in the store. But, but rushing out to buy a car is not most people's first choice. So it's something that's slower to respond. So if I'm right about the hard landing, that's bad for the car market. Here's the nuance though, is that uh, luxury cars do better in a recession than everyday cars. Because it's the everyday people who get hurt the most. You know, the people oh, are gonna buy Lambos and Ferraris. That, you know, the recession isn't gonna stop them from buying a Lambo. You know, if you got that much money, right? You're still gonna buy your Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, interesting. I never, I never thought of that. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, but but here's the here's the takeaway. EVs are mostly considered luxury cars. So if the question is for platinum and palladium and the economy is going to be worse on your ICE engines than on your electric cars, what does that say about the likely impact for these industrial metals that go into the ICE engines? Yeah, Just very good point. Saying, I don't know the future. These, these are the facts that history tells us. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, oil and gas. Uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Outlook for oil in a soft recession, probably not go down as much as uh, uh, in a hard recession. And Kaz has a question on what is. Sorry, let, let me let me jump on that real quick. Okay. You, you know, with you know, in, in this, I don't know how it's going to go thing. I'm in hard landing. I'm not buying any old stocks now. If I thought it, if I thought differently, if I thought no landing or soft landing was in, I would be buying the dip right now. As you and I speak, as we're recording, oil has dropped below 70 because Israel didn't bomb Iran's oil infrastructure. Well, where was oil before Iran might have had its oil infrastructure bombed? It was well over 70. So, I mean, this sell-off right now strikes me as a contrarian buying opportunity. If I was in team no landing or even very soft landing, I'd be buying oil stocks today. But I'm not. I, I do think the odds favor us seeing lower prices ahead. So okay. I'm gonna, uh, I'm I, gonna I can't buy help but bring up the chart here. And I already had the green line drawn before you said that. <laughs> there you go. Right? Okay, so, so this is the soft landing uh, buying point. Uh, hard landing buying point is somewhere south of that. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Kaz wants to know, what does Lobo think about royalty trusts versus royalty companies? Uh, no comment. I mean, we're getting into the to the finer points. I, I like the royalty concept in general streaming, you know, to be able to profit and, and see expanded margins with somebody else having to do the actual literal dirty work of mining. I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Now, of course, a lot of people do. So you tend to pay premiums, you probably get a little less alpha there, but it's relatively safer than even the biggest you know, mining companies, the supposedly most solid ones. Uh, so I, I love the royalty space, but sorry, this question, the, the nuances, I just, the whole sector is so volatile. It, it just, it just doesn't matter to me. If I find a great royalty company and I can buy it at a cyclical low, I'm confident it's going to do well. You know, it's, it's, it's one of my, it's one of those things that you anchor your barbell with. You know, something like that on the safe end, and then my hockey stick potential, you know, nano caps on the other end. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I guess my uh, concern with some of like the oil royalty ones is, uh, yeah, they pay 10% in some cases, but man, hitting a recession, those could fall by 60% and your dividend goes away overnight, huh? Sure. But, yeah, I mean, if if you're... Maybe maybe this is me just reacting based on my own. You know, I don't buy stocks for dividends. I'm I'm not in them for income. I'm I'm not at that stage in my life where I'm just trying to you know preserve my capital and have fixed income based on my investments. I'm looking for capital gains, and so I'm looking for big moves in the market. And in in that case, where I'm looking for big capital gains, the differences between these things are not that great. But but yeah, sure. Other things being equal, those things do matter. Uh, and I guess I'll just plead ignorance. I, that's not an analysis that I'm doing for myself, for my own portfolio. And it's not something I get into. Okay. All righty. Authentic answer. And uh, Bojo, you have a super fan here, sir. Uh, he says, does he have any openings to kick rocks for him? And what qualifications would he look for if he does? Well, no and yes, perhaps. Um here, I guess here's how it's come to work. This, this, this wasn't an official plan. It wasn't designed this way. But occasionally somebody really loves what I do. They want to learn. They raise their hand and we take them on as an intern. And if they do any good, then they may become an analyst. And yes, I now send my analysts out into the field. I have a team now that I've trained. They're really good. And I feel some regret about this because kicking the rocks is the most fun part. And I've trained a bunch of guys that are really good at it, so I don't need to do it anymore. Now it's gotten to, and it makes no sense for both of us to go. It's fun, but it's not a, you know, rational business expense. 
So I end up going to the conferences and talking because I'm the public face of the company now. And my guys go out and kick the rocks and go in the mine tunnels and have all the fun, you know, with the geologists in the field. I'm kind of bummed about this, but it, it makes sense. Um, so if you're, we're not hiring. I think we have, the team is big enough now for the workload we have. We are expanding. We uh, under my, we have a service called My Take. The Independent Speculator is the newsletter with my portfolio. It's all built around what I'm doing with my own money. That's the flagship publication. There's this other thing called My Take. It's not my portfolio. There is no portfolio. It's more like Consumer Reports, where we review companies, we evaluate companies that readers ask about. There's almost a thousand companies under coverage. Obviously, that's more than even I can handle on my own. Uh, so I have this team, and clients, you know, keeps growing. People keep asking for more, and, and the team does grow over the time. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, basically, if you're interested, send me an email. Use the contact form on our website. Send me your CV. Oh, qualifications. And and so when an opening happens, either you know an intern drops out or gets upgraded, or we're looking for more, or we just we have more enough more companies under coverage that we need to add to the team. Then I'll look at the pool of intern applicants and we'll see where we go. Uh, the qualifications are mostly, believe it or not, enthusiasm, attitude. Um, I don't care if you have an MBA. Or, that's probably a negative, actually. <laughs> you know, uh, experience in the in investing and so on is good to have that vocabulary, but a sharp mind that can learn quickly and wants to and is interested. You know, that's irreplaceable. I, I somebody who who just loves this and wants to be involved. I can't teach that. I can't inculcate that. It's either there or it's not. And if it's there, I can teach them, you know, what Doug Casey and Rick Rule and all these other guys taught me over the years. The, the knowledge is transferable. The attitude is not. Um, you know, I'd hire a high school kid if he or she had the right attitude. I'd hire a 90-year-old if he or she had the right attitude uh, and, you know, was flying on all thrusters and so on. Wouldn't matter to me. You sound like you're describing uh, the way Rick Rule described you 25 years ago. <laughs> Could be, but you know, it's the literal truth. If somebody sends me a CV, a resume, I don't even look at the education. I, I look at the experience. That's all I care about. Yeah. And yeah. and by the way, you know, attitude. People can bullshit. You know, they can they can act fluffy and bright eyed and, and bushy tailed and whatnot. And then after you worked with them for a while, you realize, no, this, this isn't going to work. I, I've i never found a reliable method. And it was just one reason why we do these interns. So it's basically a get to know you phase. You know, If it's not working, I'll drop you like a hot coal, right? Uh, sorry, but it's not working. If it is working, then the good news is, you know, there were no artificial barriers. You didn't have to jump through hoops of, you know, PhDs or whatever. I don't care about any of that. All I care about is, an energetic person who's smart and wants to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, we're both going to be out at the New Orleans Investment Conference. Speaking of conferences, uh, this will be my first uh, NOIC. Uh, do you have any advice, anything you'd recommend? Yes, uh, actually. I First is go. And I'm not saying that because Brian London is paying me to say that. In fact, the, a lot of these conferences do uh, pay newsletter writers and so on commissions for referrals, and I don't accept them. Um, if I can, I, I, I ask them to offer it as a discount to my readers, but usually they don't want to do that because they don't want other people to look bad, but I, I don't accept any commissions. So if I say something like this, it's, it's what I think, okay? I think if you go to these conferences and you ask the CEOs and the geologists your questions, no matter how newbie they might be, whatever, just Doing that, just getting off your butt and doing that already 80-20 rule puts you way ahead of the investment herd because most people are never going to do that. And even if you're not a PhD geologist and they, you know, throw all this jargon at you, you have no idea what they're talking about. You know, you've spoken to a used car salesman in your life probably once or more. And so you get the idea that these people, you know, they won't look you in the eye, you know, oh, well, let me ask my CFO. I'll get back to you on that. You know, that's valuable intel. So it's absolutely worth going just to go out there, ask your questions, see how you feel about these people. That's relevant data. Um, they do have these speaking hall tours. If you, if you happen to be with me on one of those, you know, I'll ask obnoxious questions and we'll see what we get from the answers. Um, 
And then, you know, what else? Uh, you know, I'll have a workshop, but I don't want to just put it on me. Uh, Brent's kind of, Brent Cook's kind of retired, but his 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 new guy, Joe Mazumdar, seems to be the real deal. He really knows his stuff. So, you know, if you go to a presentation or a workshop by Joe, I'm, I'm sure you would learn something. Um, you know, so there's there's other people out there like that, that, that um, you know, basically up your game. This is, you know, self-improvement is a great investment. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you're right about Joe Mazumdar. He's been in the rural classroom and the guy's just been phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that, Lobo. Uh, I'll have a little booth. Brian set us up on the media row. So uh, if you come by, I'd love to interview you again for, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Do it live. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much. If uh, people want to get a hold of you, uh, we'll put all your links down in the show notes below. Any final thoughts? Sure, just the, the quick... One is sign up for the free letter. You may or may not agree with my thinking. You may want to fight with you about palladium or whatever. Fine. Uh, the one thing I can guarantee is that I won't spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. I hate that. You know, try the free letters, see if you like the way they think. And even if you disagree with me on some things, you know, remember, I, I'm not here to compliment you or blow sunshine your way. I'm I'm here to be a due diligence guy. And there's I hope value in that. Yes. Well, I will second the free newsletter. It's a must read for me every week. And um, thank you for doing it. Uh, thank you for coming back on the show, Lobo. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And thank you for tuning in. Be sure to support the show and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time.